Did you know that atoms in molecules are not still and they actually vibrate really, really fast? We can use infrared spectroscopy to identify how they vibrate and to learn a lot more about the samples that we're analyzing. And this is today's topic. Hello and welcome back to my channel. And if you're new here, I'm Maria and I create videos related to cultural heritage and how we can use science to analyze and preserve objects of cultural heritage. We've seen in a previous video, when we talked about the electromagnetic spectrum, how the infrared radiation is electromagnetic radiation of lower energy than that of the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum. In today's video, we will see how we can use the infrared light to understand the composition of materials. We will see what is infrared spectroscopy, what kind of information we can extract from an infrared spectrum, and we'll get fun insights into molecular vibrations. And if you stay until the end, you will learn what kind of information IR spectroscopy can provide in the analysis of objects and sites of cultural heritage. Let's start by having a look at the infrared spectroscopy method. We'll see how it works and how we can obtain the infrared spectra. First, we'll have a look at the general idea of how infrared spectroscopy works when we want to analyze an object. Let's say we want to analyze a painting. First, we select which area of the painting we want to investigate. And then, we shine the beam of infrared light from the IR source in the instrument and onto the area we want to investigate. After we send the IR beam into the sample, we then record, with the help of a detector, how much of that radiation is transmitted through to the detector after the molecules of the sample absorb the radiation of certain frequencies. We'll see exactly what that means when we'll talk about the IR spectrum. This recorded signal is then analyzed and we obtain spectra. And from the IR spectra, we can extract information about the chemical groups that are present in the sample. And then, by comparing those spectra to reference spectra of known compounds, we can identify the composition of the sample. There are different types of infrared instruments. Here is one example of an infrared spectrometer which is portable. As you can see from this image, the instrument is pretty small and we can place it on a tripod. It doesn't even need a designated area in a lab. So we can even take it with us to remote archaeological sites for experiments. Moreover, another advantage of this infrared spectrometer is that it can record IR experiments non-invasively, which is of great advantage when we deal with objects of cultural heritage. Now that we've seen the IR spectrometer and we have a general idea about how it works, let's see what kind of information we can obtain from IR spectroscopy. Here is an example of an infrared spectrum. In order to understand what are all these lines that we see here, we have to go back to atoms and molecules. In a previous video, which I will link in the top right corner and in the video description if you want to watch it later, we've seen how atoms come together to form molecules. But these atoms are not static, they are dynamic and the molecular vibrations are really, really fast in the order of 10 to the 13th to the 10 to the 14th hertz. What does that mean exactly? It means that they vibrate 100 trillion times per second. So as I said, that's really, really fast. How fast they vibrate depends on which type of atoms are bonded together and on the type of bond that we have between those atoms. Now let's have a look at the vibrational modes in molecules. We'll keep on using the water molecule as example and we'll label the two hydrogen atoms connected to the oxygen atom as hydrogen A and hydrogen B to make it easier for us to follow them during the different vibrational modes. The first vibrational mode we're exploring is the symmetric stretch. This means that the bonds between the oxygen atom and the two hydrogen atoms stretch at the same time as the arrows indicate. So the bonds become longer and then, as the arrows indicate, they become shorter again. The second type of vibration is the asymmetric stretch. In this case, as the arrows indicate, while one bond becomes longer, the other one becomes shorter. So let's see what that looks like.
So now you've seen how when the bond between hydrogen B and the oxygen atom is longer, the bond between hydrogen A and the oxygen gets shorter. And the same happens when the bond between hydrogen A and the oxygen atom is longer, then the bond between hydrogen B and the oxygen atom becomes shorter. Another possible vibration is called scissoring, because like the scissors blades, the two hydrogen atoms come closer together and then move further apart as the opening and closing of a scissor. Let's see what that looks like. You've seen here how the two hydrogen atoms came closer together and then they moved further apart again. The next vibrational mode is called rocking. In this case, both hydrogens move in the same direction as indicated by the arrows and then they return together again. The final two vibrational modes are called wagging and twisting. In wagging, both hydrogen A and hydrogen B are coming outside of the screen and then moving back inside at the same time, as it is indicated by the plus sign next to the two hydrogen atoms. In twisting, while hydrogen A is coming outside of the screen, hydrogen B is moving deep inside and then they reverse roles. This is indicated by the plus sign and the minus sign next to the two atoms. Each of these vibrational modes in a specific functional chemical group has a specific vibrational frequency. And this is what we see in IR spectra. Let's go back to the IR diagram where we've seen that we irradiate the sample with infrared radiation. If the frequency of the infrared radiation matches the vibrational frequency of the molecule, and this can be a match between the IR frequency and the frequency of any of the vibrational modes in any of the functional groups in the molecule, then the radiation is absorbed by the molecule. And because the molecule absorbs the radiation, then there is none or little radiation that is then transmitted on to the detector. If, on the other hand, there is no match between the frequency of the radiation and the vibrational frequencies in the sample, then the molecule does not absorb radiation and the radiation ends up being transmitted through to the detector. And that's what we see in an infrared spectrum. We see the percentage of the radiation transmitted through the sample as a function of frequency. In the spectrum, you see it as a function of wave number, but there is a direct relationship between frequency and wave numbers. So the lower the peaks go, the less percentage of the radiation is transmitted, meaning more radiation is absorbed by the molecule. And that means that those peaks are the frequencies where the molecule vibrates. Since different vibrational modes in different types of functional groups with different kinds of bonds have specific frequencies whose ranges are known and given in various tables, we can use all that information to analyze our IR spectrum. This can help us identify the chemical bonds, the functional groups, and the vibrational modes in the sample that we're measuring. Additionally, if we compare our spectrum to the IR spectra from large databases of IR spectra for reference compounds, we can identify the chemical composition of the sample we're investigating. This has many applications in cultural heritage when we want to identify the type of chemicals that are present in heritage objects or sites. We can use IR to analyze paints, varnishes and treatments of paintings and other heritage objects. We can also study objects made of fibers, polymers, and clays. In the future, we will focus more on case studies where IR spectroscopy was used to study objects and sites of cultural heritage. I hope you enjoyed learning about infrared spectroscopy and the kind of information we can obtain from infrared spectra. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe and hit the bell button to receive notifications when I upload new videos from the world of cultural heritage and heritage science. And now, as always, I have a question for you. To which archaeological site would you take the IR instrument for analysis? Let me know your answers in the comments below this video. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye!